Uh, this morning, um, so we had an issue with the tripod of the other camera, so I'm going to be putting this video up online, so the quality may be a little lower than usual, but uh, that's all we got this morning. Um, this morning, we're going to be doing a starting a verse-by-verse -verse series in the book of Proverbs. So it's going to take us a little while, but we're going to cover a lot of different things. If you want to go ahead and turn your your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1. It's going to take us a while, but we're going to cover a wide variety of different topics and um, bounce back and forth all throughout the Scriptures because it's going to reference back to different passages to give us second witnesses. And the children, the older children specifically, Finley, Denton, uh, I want you all to pay close attention, especially today and the rest of this series, because there's a lot of stuff in here that you all... Um, not just children, but adults too, but you all need to understand and pay attention. So listen to me very carefully. Uh, the book of Proverbs was written by King Solomon's son, uh, King David's son Solomon. And it's little bite-sized chunks of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And they are easy to understand, but sometimes not so easy to understand. Sometimes you have to chew on them, and it can be a half a verse just a few words and, you know, ponder on them, but there's a lot of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in there. And King Solomon was known as one of the wisest men in the, the world besides Jesus. But King Solomon is a testament that you can have all the wisdom in the world, be knowledgeable, and have lots of understanding, but if you don't take your own advice you'll fall. And uh, we'll get to, into that as we go on in this series, because he was the wisest man at the time, but he didn't take his own advice. In fact, he had a terrible ending. But he wrote this book when he was taking his own advice, and he was wise. And I want us to turn to Proverbs chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 1 to 7 this morning. Go ahead and start with that. And we're going to talk about what wisdom, understanding, um, Knowledge, judgment, justice, interpretation are this morning, because those are all things that are kind of a foundational piece in all Scripture, but also in this book. It says here, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity to give subtly to simple to the young men knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels to understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what Solomon is saying here is he's saying it, he's in the following pages in these Proverbs, you're going to, and not, not just the book of Proverbs, but the whole Bible, the whole Word of God, you will get, it'll give a person wisdom, knowledge, understanding, instruction, discretion, and you need to have proper interpretation of that to understand those things. But he's saying, he's laying the foundation in the following pages, you're going to find these things. And this is very foundational, but we know as a people that today in the world we live in today, uh, the world is full of fools that despise the Word of God. They despise wisdom, instruction, understanding. So this isn't a child foundational thing. This is something we deal with as adults every, every day. And uh, some of the things I'm going to say this morning may be very elementary. It may seem elementary, but... Every time I, I do an elementary message, I get people that will tell me, well, that's just milk. Well, the funny thing about that is, is, is it milk when we're failing at it? You know, I mean, is it milk? Um, I think it's only milk if we've mastered it completely and we're just perfect at it. Um, I know last year at, at the conference, I did, a, um, I did some messages on forgiveness and things like that. And uh, there was someone there that, uh, two people actually, that contacted me after the conference saying, you know, such milk. But I could, I, I wasn't picking on them in my own mind, but I could see things that they were failing on that I talked about in the sermon. Um, so 
I mean, unless we're mastering it, it's not milk. Forgiveness is not milk. In fact, forgiving somebody can be the hardest thing. Uh, having proper wisdom, understanding, and instruction can be some of the hardest things. So what we're going to talk about this morning is very foundational, but also very needy also. So in, in the book of Proverbs, we have wisdom being spoken about, we have knowledge being spoken about, we have understanding. And sometimes I don't think a lot of people understand the difference between them all. They kind of lump them all in t t together, but there's actually big differences. Children, I want you to understand this especially. What wisdom, knowledge, and understanding is particularly, and we'll get into all the other ones here momentarily, but I want to give you a definition of knowledge, and I want you to think about it, ponder on it. This is what Noah Webster, in his 1828 dictionary, said on knowledge. Quote, a clear and certain perception of that which exists, or of truth in fact, the perception of the connection and agreement or disagreement or repugnancies of our ideas. We can have no knowledge of that which does not exist. God has a perfect knowledge of all his works. Human knowledge is very limited and is mostly gained by observation and experience. So, knowledge is facts. Our knowledge is truth. Um, we understand that honeybees make what? Honey, okay. That is knowledge. There was some point in history that man did not know that. That was a fact that they did not know. They had to find out the hard way, I imagine. Uh, some guy that was very curious went and dug around in a beehive and found out that stuff tasted really good. That was knowledge, uh, just like with certain plants. You know, who was the first guy to figure out that uh, hemlock was poisonous? or all the other poisonous plants. I'm sure there was some guy that tried to eat poison ivy at one point or another. In fact, I've, I've known people that said they'd done that, but <laughs> uh, that's knowledge to know that's a bad idea. Um, we understand papers made out of what, children? Wood? Okay, that's knowledge on how we, man obtained knowledge on how to make paper from wood, wood pulp. It took a man to think about how to take wood, chop it up, make it into a pulp, and then make paper out of it. That's knowledge. It's facts. And we know that God made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we know that that covenant is still here today. That's knowledge. That's a fact. That's something that we know. And we know that Jesus died for our what? Okay, that's knowledge. That's things that we, we, we know. We know for a fact. We, we read that in Scripture and we understand it. What about wisdom? What's wisdom? Let me give you a definition of wisdom here uh, from Noah Webster. It says here, quote, The right, right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends and of the end, best means to accomplish them. This is wisdom and act, effect and practice. If wisdom is to be considered as a, a faculty of mind. It is the faculty of discerning or judging what is most just, proper, and useful. If it is to be considered as an acquirement, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conductive to properly, uh, to prosperity or happiness. Wisdom in the first sense, or practical wisdom, is nearly synonymous with discernment. If differ, it differs somewhat from prejudice, uh, pr excuse me, from prudence in this respect, prudence is the exercise of sound judgment in avoiding evils or bad things. Wisdom is the exercise of sound judgment either in avoiding evils or attempting good. End quote. So, to sum all those words up, wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. Now, think about that for a minute. If you have knowledge, that paper comes from trees. Wisdom would be properly using the paper, having the wisdom and the discernment and the judgment in order and how to make that happen. Now, we have a lot of knowledge, each and each of us here. Uh, some, sometimes they call it useful knowledge on how things are made, uh, how things come about, but we don't have the wisdom to do those things. You know, I can tell you, I have the knowledge of how a plane flies, you know, jet engine and 
the engine, you put jet fuel in it, you fire it up, or if it's even a, a, it has a propeller, you, you spin the propeller fast enough to give it lift. I have the knowledge of that, but I could not build you an airplane. I don't have the wisdom to build an airplane. Um, and there's so many different applications to that that we can uh, put that to. If we have the knowledge of the Abrahamic covenant and who it was made with, and we have the knowledge of the new covenant and who it was made with, then we have the wisdom of who it was made with through understanding Scripture. Actually, that's a little bit of knowledge, too. You know, you, you can know the, that the covenant exists. You can know who it's made with. So that's more knowledge than wisdom. Wisdom would be properly using that. So let's look at it this way. If we're in the new covenant, and we know that, and we are, wisdom would be properly living our lives according to the new covenant, be properly using that knowledge. Um, another example, if we have the knowledge that transgression of God's law back in the Old Testament were bad for Israel, and that sin in general is bad, I mean, all sin across the board, but we don't have the wisdom to realize that that sin today affects us. Well, in knowledge, too, wisdom and knowledge. If we don't have the wisdom and knowledge to properly know that that sin applies to us today, then we're lack of both of those things. We're lack of the knowledge of knowing that it does apply to us, and we're lack of wisdom to know that it applies to us and how it properly is used. Does that make sense? So what about understanding? What is understanding? Uh, Noah Webster defines it as this. Quote, The faculty of the human mind by which it apprehends the real state of things presented to it, or by which it receives or comprehends the ideas which others express and intend to communicate. The understanding is called also the intellectual fa faculty. It is the faculty by means, which, by means of which we obtain a great part of our knowledge. And this is kind of a more in-depth part of knowledge. You have knowledge, but understanding is knowing how something works. You know, we can have the knowledge that bees make honey, but understanding is knowing how they make honey, how they go out and they gather nectar, not nectar, but the, uh, the pollen, and they come back and they make nectar, they go and collect water, and that's part of the process. Understanding is knowing how that happens. Um, another example, God's law tells us not to eat pork and shellfish and all those things. Let's just use pork as an example. We can have the knowledge that God said don't do that, we can have the wisdom enough to know that we should obey it. Understanding would be, and even this is just small because we don't understand everything. Understanding would be that we, if we eat pork, we could get worms and it'd be bad for our health. So knowledge is understanding that God gave us that. Wisdom is knowing and having the proper use of knowing we should do that. And understanding is knowing a little bit of why he told us to do that. And uh, it wasn't just because of health. It was holiness into it as well. He told us not to, but we can understand a little bit. And um, when things in God's Word often understanding, we can only glimpse a little bit of it anyway. There's always something that we're missing. So what about justice? Solomon brings up justice here. What is justice? And this one's pretty easy. Um, Noah Webster defines it as this. The virtue which consists in every... Excuse me, reading words that aren't there. The virtue which consists in giving to everyone what is his due. Now, obviously, this is in contrast or in combination with God's law. We're talking about justice in God's law, God's word, since that's what we're reading in the Bible. So the virtue, justice is the virtue which consists in giving to everyone which is his due according to God's law. It's something that we could add in there. That is God's law and God's justice. Is If you are do something, you do it, because that is justice. If you are do something and you don't get that, that is not justice. That is injustice. Um, for example, if God's law says murderers should be put to death after they murder somebody, is that injustice or justice? That's justice, because... They should be put to death. That's what God's law says. Now, we cannot like that all we want. But if we, you know, I often hear people say, 
when they're against the death penalty. They may be Christians. They may go, carry their Bible every Sunday to church, and they may believe in the Ten Commandments and everything like that. But sometimes they'll have a family member, and I've heard this several times, that murdered somebody. Maybe he was drunk. Maybe he was in a bad part of his life. And they'll say, well, I'm not for the death penalty because I don't think he should die for what he did. He, he, he was at a bad place in his life, and he shouldn't have done that. But, you know, he's a better man now. Now, that may be the case. And, and, and God grants repentance and, and things like that. But think about what that person says. And I've heard at least two or three people tell me this. They're saying that I am in favor of injustice against God's Word because I feel in my heart that that person shouldn't die. But justice is saying they should die. According to a biblically governing society, obviously, not a vigilante type instance. But, I mean, the death penalty would be applied to that. Now, if someone comes along and says, no, God's law is wrong, I want to do it this way, that's injustice. It's not justice. That person is due to die if they murder somebody. And it doesn't even matter if they were, what the circumstances, if they murdered, not manslaughter or accidental, but if they murder somebody, they should die. And I think there's lots of implications on why you do that. Um, I, I think we could get into that at some other time, but I think it's not good to let murderers just continue going in society and continuing and continue reproducing. Um, it, it's bad. We see it today, all the time. And not just murder, all kinds of different crimes against God's law. Okay, what about judgment? Um, the act of judging. Now, this is a big one because most Christians say, well, thou shalt not judge. You know, judge not, at least you be judged. But here, I mean, Solomon is bringing up judgment. He says here in verse 3, to receive the instruction of the wisdom, justice, and judgment. So here, this what is judgment? And if we shouldn't judge, then why is he even bringing it up? Now, it's impossible not to judge. We judge when we get in the, uh, up in the morning. We judge when we go to the bathroom. We judge on what street we're going to turn on. It's absolutely stupid when someone says you shouldn't judge. We judge every single day. I mean, if someone were to walk in here this morning with whiskey on their breath, we would make a, we'd be making a judgment in our mind saying, hey, that guy smells like whiskey. I'll bet it's awful early in the morning. That's a judgment, is it not? That is a judgment that people make. Uh, we make it all the time. Um, sometimes you judge. I know many times you judge that a person's an idiot, you know, especially if you're working with them. You're sitting there like, this guy's an idiot. Uh, I'm making the judgment that I may not want to be around him very often. May be bad for my health, which we'll talk about that here in a moment when it comes to hanging around with people that you shouldn't. But um, that is a judgment we make. Judging is not bad. Now, judging in an unjust way is wrong. I mean, we got to be careful how we judge other people. We have to judge in a just way. You know, when a person murders somebody, we are judging that they mur murdered somebody by the evidence presented, or maybe we even witnessed it. Then we're still making a judgment. It's impossible not to make judgments. But Noah Webster defines the act of judging this way. To compare facts or ideas and perceive their agreement or disagreement, and thus to distinguish truth from falsehood. So what if I were to tell you all that the walls in here were blue this morning? Children, what, what, would, you all, what would you all say? Okay, well, I would be judging that you're wrong too, because the walls aren't white, they're brown. Said the, I said the walls, not the ceiling. See, we both judged. And we, and we, now, if I were to say they were blue, and you all would say, no, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm comparing the facts and ideas and perceiving their agreement and disagreement, and thus to distinguish truth from falsehood, I'm saying that they're brown. You're making a judgment. Um, that is not wrong. That, that could be too. You're making a judgment that I may be colorblind. But if I was colorblind, I couldn't see blue. So now I'm making a judgment that you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you see how judging works? See, it's not wrong. It's We do it every day. So when someone says, uh, don't judge, they really don't know what they're talking about. And we'll get into that verse at some other time in, in Matthew. But judging is impossible not to judge. We all judge. Um, there's just justing. 
excuse me, there's just judging and there's unjust justing, judging. <laughs> I say that five times fast. Um, there's just judging and there's unjust justing, judging. <laughs> um, you can do it right and you can do it wrong. Uh, what about discretion? Uh, discerning something. Discernment, the act of discerning. What does that mean? Well, that's the act of judging, but you're using wisdom while you're judging. You're judging, you know, just like we just did. You know, anyone can judge, and you can be completely wrong in your judgment. Using discernment is judging and using knowledge, wisdom, and understanding while you're judging. So you want that as well. What about interpretation? Interpretation, that is a very important thing, not just in biblical studies, but just listening to how someone talks, what they say. You can say things that are completely weird. Excuse me, let's put it this way. You can say things that are completely wrong, right, or completely off subject, and someone can interpret it one way and someone can interpret it the other. Let me give you an example here. Um, I won't point it out, but uh, at our last conference last year, we had one man preach a sermon, and I had three different people tell me what he preached about, and they were all completely different. All three people, families, it was complete families, interpreted what he was saying differently. That is interpretation. Now, somebody's wrong, obviously, but they interpret it differently. And a lot of times it's because people aren't clear or whatever it may be, or they're not listening. Now, sometimes people will say something, you'll say have a complete sentence, and they'll only listen to half of what you said, like Finley does sometimes. <laughs> and uh, then they only pick a word here or there, and then they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> so I want to give you an example of how Solomon used wisdom in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 16. And in this story here, he used wisdom, he used knowledge, and he used understanding. And this is one that is well known here. I was going to use Saxon as a demonstration this morning, but Cassie wouldn't let me uh, for this passage. Let's use verse 16 through 28 to read the says here. Then came there two women... There were harlots unto the king, and stood before him. And the one woman said, O Lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. And I was delivered of a child with her in the house. And it came to pass the third day after that I was delivered, that the woman was delivered also. And we were together, and there was no stranger with, with us in the house, save we two in the house. And this woman's child died in the night. Because she overlaid it, or she laid on him. She rolled over on the baby. And she arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while thine handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And whom I rose in the morning to give my child suck, behold, it was dead. But when I had considered it in the morning, behold, it was not my son, which I did bear. And the woman, other woman said, Nigh, but the living is my son, and the dead is thy son. And this is said, No, but the son is thy, excuse me, the, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus they spake before the king, and then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is dead. And the other saith, Nay, but the son, thy son is dead, and thy, my son is living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. And then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. And then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay, slay it. She is the mother, therefore. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. 
So what happened was, is these women brought this child before him, the living child, obviously. And um, one was saying it was my child, one was saying it was the others. So he had the wisdom and understanding. He understood the situation. He had the wisdom to know, if I say to these mothers, I'm going to cut your child in half and give you one, child, one half and one the other, what do you think the real mother would say? Well, the real mother, he had the wisdom to know the real mother would say, oh, no, give her the child. I would rather my child live than have it. Just let her have it. And that's what happened. Now, once he did that, he used this. I don't think he was really going to kill the child. He used this to identify who the real mother is because he had the wisdom and understanding to know that a mother's instinct was for no one to hurt her child and that she would much rather see somebody else with her child than see it cut in half right before. You see how he used wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in that? Now let's look at verse 7 again in Proverbs chapter 1. Let's go back to there. It says here, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and understanding. Excuse me, wisdom and instruction. The Brenton Septuagint puts it this way. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and there is good understanding to all that precise it, excuse me, practice it. And, and pity towards God is in the, excuse me, and piety towards God is the beginning of discernment. But the ungodly will set at naught wisdom and instruction. Let's read that again since I botched it up a little bit. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, and there is good understanding to all that practice it. And piety towards God is the beginning of discernment. But the ungodly will set at naught wisdom and instruction. Um, I find that the Brenton Septuagint, the Septuagint in general, expand upon the, the Proverbs a little bit more than the King James. And we're going to go through that as we go along. But to me, that makes a whole lot more sense and it expands it more than just the King James. The, the word fear here means reverence, to reverence someone. And it is commanded for us to reverence God, to fear God. Now, oftentimes, fear isn't the best word for that, but other times it is. We should fear God. We should fear His judgment. We should fear His um, what we do when we don't obey Him. And then we should reverence Him in that way. And Noah Webster defines reverence as this way. And this is what we should do to God. And it says here, according to the proverb, that uh, we should um, fear God, and it is the beginning of knowledge. So. We can't even begin to know knowledge. We can't even begin to understand knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, instruction, unless we fear God. And we see that today. Well, there's a lot of people that are what we call book smart. You know, they may know facts and things like that, but they're really idiots. They have no knowledge, wisdom, and understanding in reality. That They just don't get it. And a lot of that, I think, stems back to them not fearing and reverencing God. Because if you fear and reverence God, what do you do? You keep His commandments. You obey Him. If you keep His commandments and you obey Him, you're, you're, you're doing wise things. You, you're wise. You're doing things that are knowledgeable, too, because you can't have wisdom and knowledge. You can't have knowledge without having wisdom. Excuse me. You can't have wisdom without having knowledge. I'm just getting it all backwards this morning. So I want to read this quote here. <clears throat> the fear acceptable to God is a fear and awful reverence of the divine nature proceeding from a just esteem of His perfection, which produces in us an inclination to His service and an unwillingness to offend Him. Let's read that last part again. This, this act of reverence, which produces in us an inclination, a desire to His service and an unwillingness to offend Him. So reverence and fear of God pulls us into His service. We want to do good. We want to obey Him. We want to love Him. You love me. You keep my commandments. Uh, we want to do that. And the act of offending Him or disobeying Him is something that we don't want to do. We don't want to do that. We want to 
stray away from that. We want to try to get away from it as far as we can. We want to make sure that we're doing good. That is the act of reverence, the act of fear of God, is doing what God wants us to do and, and not wanting to offend Him. Can you, can you understand how having that can bring about wisdom, knowledge, and understanding? Because you're already doing what God wants you to do. You're in His service. You're, you're, you're following Him. So I think that's what Solomon is pointing to, is that if you're reverencing God, you're obeying God. If you're obeying God, you have knowledge, wisdom, and understanding because you're doing all these things. You're reading His Word. You're understanding the Proverbs. And he, he says here that the fool despises wisdom. He despises it. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. He despises instruction, obviously godly instruction. And that here is what we see the opposite in our society today. We see fools that absolutely despise God's word. They despise instruction. And um, that's how our society is so bad today, how the world is so bad. So this is the good end of it. And we as Christian Israelites, we it's built into us to love truth, to find truth and knowledge. And we do that through um, following God's word. Now let's look at verse 8. Verse 8, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. It says here, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. End quote. Now, here Solomon is giving reference to obeying your parents, children to obey their parents, and, and listening to their instructions. Children, are you paying attention? Solomon here is saying that God is, excuse me, that we should obey and listen to the instruction and law of our mother and our father. That's hearkening back to the fifth commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. The Britain Septuagint says it this way, Hear, my son, the instruction of thy father, and reject not the rules of thy mother. Now, obviously, this can't be, a limit, uh, this can't be taken by itself with what we just read before. You know, oftentimes I've met many people that they're like, well, my mom and dad, they weren't giving me good instruction. They weren't giving me laws that I should obey. In fact, they were, they were against God altogether. Um, are you saying that I am to hear the bad instruction of thy father and forsake not the bad law of my mother? Or, you know, that's how they would ask that question. And we got to be careful not to take one scripture and ignore the whole context of everything else. You know, because we just read how a fool forsakes wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, instruction, and things like that, the things that he just listed, and how attaining those things and having reverence to God is good. And that's the beginning of knowledge. So, obviously, if you have a parent that is, they don't reverence the Lord, let's say they don't have godly knowledge, they're going to give you bad instructions. We, we all know of cases of that. Solomon here is obviously speaking of parents, father, mothers and fathers, who fall into this category because he just listed it before. And that doesn't mean you dishonor your parents. And none of this applies to the children here because you all have good parents. You all have good parents that give you good instruction. I'm speaking more to people that may not have good parents. And there's plenty of people out there that don't. You all are very blessed to have parents who, who are giving you good instruction. So we just want to remember that we've got to look at every scripture in the context of all scripture. We can't cherry pick it. Let's look at verse 9 now. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto your head and chains about thy neck. Now, you don't literally put the instructions of your mom and dad around chains around your neck, but figuratively you do. When your mother and father give you a good instruction, you want it to be seen. You want it to be where everybody can see it, much like a necklace around your neck or, or something on your forehead. And uh, that means you obey. You obey and do. And this harkens back to being good children that obey your mom and dad and, and do what God wants you to do. That way when others see you, they see it like a necklace around your neck or an ornament. And when they do that, it's an example to others. 
they pay attention. They're like, why is that kid different than all the others? Why doesn't he say four curse words a minute like all them public schooler kids, public school kids? Um, people notice those things. Uh, why does that kid uh, not eat like a pig at the table like his mama and daddy tell him not to? You all understand? You want to do those things, that way they can be seen in you and you can be an example to other children. And you have to improve upon them, you have to build upon them. Now let's look at verse 10 through 19. We're going to read the whole section here and then we're going to end for the day and we'll pick back up next week. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, come with us and let us lay wait for blood and let us lurk Privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave, and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find all precious substance. We shall fill our house with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, and let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. And surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of thy bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privily in their own lives. So are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of the owners thereof. Now we're going to expand upon this a little bit next week with the, the greed part, but I want to focus on. this scene here that Solomon's painting. You know, he's painting a scene here of a gang of people, pretty much, that is coming to, let's say you didn't, and saying, listen, let's go and murder this guy over here. He's got a lot of goods in his bag. Let's go murder him and take all of his goods and let's ride off. Basically, you have a gang of bandits here that is wanting to get you involved to go murder this guy. Maybe Ace is the one. He, he's, he's like, hey, Denton, let's go murder this guy over here and take all his Legos. Is that bad? That's an extreme, right? What I want to point out here is very rarely does it begin that way. Very rarely do, does a guy walk up on the street and says, hey, bud, let's go kill this guy over here and take all his goods. It usually starts out very, very slowly, very small. It may be something smaller. And, 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 you know, I know this sounds like I'm speaking just to children, but this applies to adults, too, because how many adults do we have uh, in this land today that get caught up, people much older than me, get caught up in the same way. Someone gets with them, they get pure pressure. Next thing you know, they're a dope dealer or something like that, or they've killed this person or that person. They end up in prison, in jail. Because what? Because a band of bandits or whoever it may be, convinced them that it was right to go do that, and they went and did that. And like Solomon's talking about here, pure pressure, they got this guy, and they murdered him, and they stole all his goods. And it, a lot of different scenarios could be fit in here. But it may start out, and it will start out. Each and every one of the little children here, you will be faced with somebody trying to make you do something that you shouldn't because they think it's right, and they're going to make it look so good. They're going to make it seem like it is the good thing to do to go do that bad thing. And it may be somebody that's stealing. And it may be somebody that uh, talks you into stealing. I'll, I'll, I'll confess a little sin here. I'm, I'm ashamed of it, and it happened a long time ago. I was probably about eight years old, and one of the neighbor kids convinced me to go steal another neighbor kid's little matchbox car. And I went and did it. It's the only time I ever stole anything in my entire life. I did it. Was I bad? I was. You all shake your head. You know, afraid. <laughs> I did. I stole it. I'm ashamed. I'm almost 32 years old. And I'm ashamed of that to this day. Uh -huh. I don't remember who it was, but I did. I think it was. <laughs> I stole it. And I, I think I still have the car somewhere as a reminder. And I, I, he had a little kid had his car sitting out in the yard, and I, I went and stole it. it. It was shameful. It was a terrible thing. I shouldn't have done it. Um, 
But that kid talked me into doing it. Just like that. That is bad. And shameful. Now, it's, it, could, it, could, it could have started there, and I could have went into an entire life of thievery after that. <laughs> but it may have started with me stealing a matchbox car. Right? Or it could have been smoking. Somebody talking into smoking, doing drugs, which someone will, at some point probably in your all's life, try to convince you to do, take some kind of poison that's bad for you. And they'll use peer pressure. They will do things to make it bad. And like I said, this applies to the children, but uh, it applies to adults too. There's plenty of adults that need to hear this. Um, not particularly you all. I don't think you all are on dope or anything. <laughs> but children, you will be faced with this. It'll be much worse for you than it was for me um, and everyone else here. But just like me stealing that little matchbox car, that was shameful. That was wrong. But the little kid told me to do it. Now, was it his fault for convincing me to go lay in wait and take that little kid? No, it was mine. Take the little kid's matchbox car. Um, it was wrong. It was absolutely wrong. And it was a sin. And other people will convince you to do other things like that. And you, you know deep down they're wrong. You know. That little voice in, in, in deep down that tell you, no, don't do that. Um, you'll hear it and you'll ignore it. But you don't need to ignore it. You need to say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't care if you think it's cool or not or, or whatever. You need to stop. And you know, say, so I'm going to do what's right. That's why studying God's word is so right. Now, let's look at one more verse before we close. It goes back to this. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3. Paul sums up the problem here in this one verse. He sums it up. It says here, I'm going to read out the New American Standard because it's a little clear. Do not be deceived. It means do not be fooled. Don't be, wrong, don't be tricked into thinking something else. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. What's that mean? A bad person, it will corrupt a good person. Now, oftentimes in life, we think, in, especially in churchianity today, we think the opposite. We think good people will corrupt bad people, right? Corrupt them to the good? That's not what the Bible says. It says bad company corrupts good morals. Now, I'm not saying a person can't turn when they see the good in a person and say, hey, I want to do that. My life's a mess. But more times than not, the bad will come in and corrupt the good. How many of you have heard one, one bad apple will corrupt the whole bunch, the whole barrel? How many of you all seen a bowl of apples in the fridge with one bad apple in it, and it, it makes more of them go bad? Children? Yeah, I'd paid attention. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but you have. One bad apple, one rotten apple will make all the other ones go bad. That's a biblical principle because Paul here is saying, don't be deceived, bad company, bad people, people you shouldn't be hanging around, shouldn't have in your company, will corrupt you and make you do bad things. Just like Solomon's talking about here in Proverbs. When he says, my son, if sinners, if transgressors of God's law entice thee, Consent thou not. We can just forget the whole sin and blood part and just po focus in on verse 10. My son and daughters, everybody listening here, if sinners, people who transgress God's law, entice you to transgress God's law and do what's wrong, consent not. Don't do it. Why? Because you need to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to know that you shouldn't do that. You need to have reverence to God that you shouldn't do that. So, that is why we try to have good company around us, right? We don't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry in here influencing everybody under the sun. We want to have good influence, good company, and that way you all are not corrupted. And that principle can be viewed on a larger scale. Um, I mean, think about the nation today. We have a bunch of bad people trying to corrupt a bunch of good people. And sometimes it may not see like, it seem like there's a bunch of good people, but that's how it works. 
So let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. That's all I got this morning. Next week, we're going to talk. We'll start back up there. Verse. Uh, we're going to go over the same passage we just read. We're going to talk about greed, and we'll continue on to the next book, the rest of the book. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the knowledge, wisdom, and understanding that you've given us, and we ask you, Lord, to let, us, let it increase, Lord. Let us do better this upcoming week than we did the last. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen.